Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War news update, first part thereof, if you ignore my breaking news update from this morning, first part thereof for the 8th of August uh, 2024. Let's get straight to where we normally start, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before, all the usual caveat supply, you can find them on the description to my video uh, below. And as you can see, a, a fairly typical number in the personnel loss category, 1,140, two tanks lost, certainly less than we have seen at very much the lowest end of the uh, of the range as well. The same can be said for armored personnel vehicles of nine lost there. That's under the daily average. And 36 artillery systems is likewise lower than normal, even though it is double the daily average average uh we are used to seeing sort of 50 to 60 plus artillery systems lost now four multiple launch rocket systems four anti-aircraft warfare systems those are both really high numbers for those category uh anti-aircraft warfare systems could be uh, being taken out in the north by kursk it could be that they're being taken out ahead of f-16s operating um four multiple launch rocket systems also particularly useful for the Ukrainians. Now, it's interesting to notice that we have one fixed-wing aircraft and one helicopter taken out as well. Now, in the Kursk area, and we're just going to come and to talk about this almost next, um, there have been claims that one, two, or three helicopters... Uh, no, yes, one, two, or three helicopters have been taken out. So certainly there's visual evidence of KA-52. There appears to be visual evidence of a Mi-8 or Mi-28N, probably Mi-28N, uh, the helicopter being hit in the rear rotor blades by a a an FPV drone and apparently that coming down, hard landing, and the crew getting out. Um, there's claims of another KA-52, but I don't... It's just a rumour. Um, and then also claim of an aircraft getting taken out. Now, I don't know whether that one aircraft added there is from the Morozovsk Air Base, where we've seen the Su-34 definitely destroyed. Satellite imagery shows it, but also so does on-the-ground footage. And it's more likely that that's going to be the aircraft taken out. But there's also a claim that fixed wing aircraft has been taken out as it was trying to drop guided glide bombs on the Kursk area. There are also claims that in the Kursk area, they've dropped guided glide bombs on their own troops, uh, the Russians, as they were evacuating out of Sudja or, or retreating out of Sudja. So, yeah, it's, it's all a bit crazy in the Kursk area. I have, as you can see up here, I've got a tab group for Kursk. I've got a huge amount of content to tell you about Kursk, and I really should get on with this because I need to go down and uh, take in some of the sun out there uh, as I'm on holiday. Anyway, uh, 59 vehicles on fuel tanks is fairly high there, eight uh, pieces of special equipment. So an interesting set of statistics here. I ignore the kind of drones and cruise missiles, 81 drones uh, there. We've seen, I don't know where they're adding those. I... <laughs> I think they they add for the daily figures like reconnaissance drones. It's not just Shahid drones. Uh, they're sizable enough drones. I don't know even like often you see Lancet drones when they take them out on on the um, the infographics that look like this. So you know, given that last night there were only four attack drones taken out, there's usually a lag with these statistics as well. So, uh, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's why I don't report these because I don't really know a when they were taken out because there's a cut off and you, there's often like you think that that happened last night but it actually happened the night before and what type of drones they were. Anyway, so moving on though, uh, there are some very interesting categories here and also some lower categories too, tanks and APVs. Um, it could be that the Russians are not attacking as much as they were in certain places. It's going to be interesting to see what the reaction is to Kursk. So the Ukrainians have gone into Kursk. They're making some really good, successful inroads into that Russian region. The Russians are ostensibly kind of providing misinformation or disinformation about what's going on there to their own domestic population to say, hey, no problem there. Uh, we've repelled the Ukrainians. They've lost all of these troops and a piece of equipment. The reality is they're panicking and it's going very well for the Ukrainians. However, the question, and we'll talk about this later, is what's the end, result, end goal for the Ukrainians? Because if they then have to dig in and defend what they've taken, then you're going to be using all sorts of troops 
equipment and resources that could be better be put be better put to use to defending Tourette's and New York and these places down on the eastern front line. So it's, it's lots of unknowns as to what's going to go on there. But um, that attack into Kursk is obviously going to affect these lost stats to some degree. And uh, yeah, anyway, looking at Andrew Perpetua's lost statistics from yesterday, it's pretty much parity across all the categories. And indeed, both sides seem to have lost quite a lot of combat assets. Uh, that's going to be the case with the Ukrainians attacking. If you're attacking, you are going to lose Bradleys and Marders and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that is going to happen. So the Ukrainians moving into Kursk is not going to be without losses. Right, so that's simply the case. What's going to happen? I, uh, but as many people have been saying, the Ukrainians need to rest back some kind of initiative. Well, it could be that that's what they're doing, as well as trying to pull resources away from the Russians, cause the Russians to rethink what they're doing and have to react to something else, rather than the Russians controlling the narrative across the whole of the front line, attacking from Kharkiv down to down through Zaporizhia, uh, forgetting Kherson for for a bit though. All of that front line, if if it's the Russians pushing here, the Russians pushing there, the Russians pushing there, then they are controlling the narrative and that means that they can put whatever troops they want wherever they want in order to achieve their goals now if ukraine does something like this then it makes the the russians have to react and it rests back a bit of initiative this is what the russians did to some degree in Kharkiv. i just don't think it was successful in Kharkiv. Uh, but it but the same problems could be in place for the ukrainians although it seems to be more successful for the ukrainians at the moment than the Kharkiv offensive was but we'll have to wait and see right anyway let's look at the ukrainian losses some comms equipment uh an m7782 hercules so that's a recovery vehicle based on the chassis of the abrams tank we've got a couple of pieces of artillery then when we look at the infantry fighting vehicles lost by the R ukrainians we see marder marder um bradley 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 marder 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 okay so you are starting to see an awful lot of the best uh, Western provided equipment for the Ukrainians being lost. And this is to be expected. There's no point having this if you're not going to use it. And we've seen them, I think, cycle through a lot of their old Soviet era equipment. And the, the question is, are they using this equipment because they have to because they've lost all the other stuff? Or are they use, using it because it's the best stuff? There's no point being given this stuff and continuing to use crappy equipment like a BMP-1 when a Marda or a Bradley is going to be far, far more effective. So, yeah, it might be because they cycled through their older equipment or it might be just because this is a better stuff to use. So let's use that and we keep our crap stuff in, in reserve. Um, so the good news is that m the more stuff is damaged and abandoned or destroyed here, uh, and the two out of the four that are abandoned or destroyed are BMPs. So that's good. Hopefully those Marders, so we've got three Bradleys and three Marders damaged. Hopefully they can be fixed up. Um, it's hard to know how much damage is done. Interesting that Lance has been used on a couple of those Marders, so that's probably meaning the Marder, those two Marders were much further behind the front line. Interesting that Molinia uh, uh, has hit an M777. This is, uh, I think, a fixed wing uh, um, drone that the Russians are using more and more. Andrew Perpetua has talked about them in some of his live streams previously. Anyway, uh, moving on, some APCs again. All of them Western provided, I think. Uh, APCs mainly abandoned and destroyed, four of those. Uh, MRAPs, five MRAPs, most of these Max Pros and all the Max Pros there, four of them destroyed or abandoned. So they're certainly losing some equipment, as you would expect, in attacking the enemy. Now, the Russians here, two helicopters, a KF 52. Uh, damaged there. Now that looks like a different KF-52 than the one I saw that looked very much more than damaged, although the, the picture quality wasn't particularly good. So I, uh, yeah, again, I haven't had time to look into his source for that. Remember he, uh, next to his, um, if we just go back here, uh, or not next to, it's often now below in the, in the, um, in the next uh, next tweet, the reply is the sources one. So he provides with uh, each of these um, registered uh, losses he provides to the right the source. So you can go and check it out. I haven't had time to do that. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting that you've got a KO-52 there that's damaged. Uh, so that could be a second KO-52 that was talked about yesterday. Uh, and that Mi-28 there 
is is one that is hit by an FPV drone. Hard to know how much damage is done to that, other than it appears that the Russians admitted they had to do a hard landing. Electronic warfare equipment taken out, a couple of bits of artillery, and then we have a number of tanks, including a T-90M, destroyed. That was abandoned, then hit by an FPV drone, so it might have already been logged as abandoned. A um, number of other tanks, and then most infantry fighting vehicles destroyed or, or abandoned. And this is the interesting thing to note, right? So you've got three, uh, six, seven, eight destroyed or abandoned, and two, so that's 80% of them destroyed or abandoned. And abandoned, I put down as mainly going to be destroyed because they get abandoned and then they get, yeah, then hit by an FPV drone. Usually that's the end of that one. So that's 80%. Where do you go to the Ukrainians and they've got four, uh, two, four, six. So they got 40%. So they both lost 10 IFEs and Ukrainians uh, have 40% destroyed and abandoned and the Russians have 80% destroyed and abandoned. And this seems to be a replicated data uh, sort of data trend that we are seeing over the course of the war where the Western equipment seems to be more survivable. Um, whether whether they can fix it up, I don't know. But, you know, fingers crossed, those martyrs and Bradleys will, will live to fight another day. And the most important thing is that the troops inside will be uh, somewhat safer. Okay, APCs for so Russians then yeah losing a lot of um, infantry fighting vehicles, BTRs, BMP ones, twos, and whatnot. Uh, APCs, uh, a number of those trucks, ATVs, civilian vehicles, all the usuals there. So um, I guess losing the aircraft for the Russians will be. Uh, really significant in terms of totting up the value of the Russian losses against the value of the Ukrainian losses, but they are losing uh, quite a few bits of kit, almost certainly because they are on the attack. Um, Russian border guards, uh, so what do we have here? Um, Russian border guards and likely also young conscripts surrender. Ah, this is it. So, right, what I have seen an awful lot of over the last couple of days because of the attacks into Kursk are large numbers of, of surrenders. Uh, the Russians are surrendering en masse in a number of different places. Uh, one of the, you know, I'm sure one of them was like 30 at once surrendering. Uh, here we, yeah, this one could be one of them actually. This could be it. More reports coming in about Russian soldiers surrendering into Ukrainian captivity. Uh, here, look, uh, reportedly this photo shows four Ukrainian Defence Forces fighters taking 40 Russian soldiers captive, according to the information from Osman, commander of the 24th unit of separate. He's been everywhere, Osman. IDAR Assault Brigade, he used to report from uh, Bakhmut, back when Bakhmut was um, um, in, the, in, the, in the midst of its uh, yeah difficulties there. So yeah, l loads of uh, captives being taken, Russian POWs that are going to be good for the exchanges because the R Russians have a lot more, I think, Ukrainian POWs. So it's good leverage there and also taking out those troops from being able to fight on uh, in that particular sector. Uh, they are there are just many many claims of uh, Russian not just claims but actually caught on video evidence of Russian POWs being taken in Kursk. So Kursk it seems to be going very well for the Ukrainians, right? Russian MOD claims on the other hand that Ukraine has 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 lost 660 personnel and 82 armored vehicles since the start of the Kursk invasion incursion, and that would seem to be typical Russian MOD nonsense. Uh, 82 armoured vehicles is highly unlikely to be true, especially since visual, visual confirmation is not forthcoming on those claims. I mean, yeah, maybe 10 at the moment, but 82. And as far as um, 660 servicemen, I, I highly doubt that as well. Uh, several pro-Russian channels report that the well-known Russian regime propagandist Yevgeny Podubny has been killed in the curse section. This is not true, actually, because footage has come out just recently that of him going to hospital, he has seriously done in. Like I, I d don't think he's going to be operating as a propagandist anymore in the near future. He's very badly injured. His car got targeted and destroyed by an FPV drone. But these kind of people, when they uh, they are lost to the war, are pretty useful for the Ukrainians because these guys spread uh, propaganda and disinformation about what's going on. You get different types of mill bloggers. Some will be quite critical and often useful for information. Uh, Romanov's quite interesting, a uh, useful one. 13th, the 13th is, I think, Fighter Bomber is. So there's some that, that you're thinking, uh, that actually, they are useful to have around and others less so. 
Um, a drone strike on a Russian train. So the, another uh, strike here on a Russian train carrying supplies for Russian troops. Great work by Ronini. Drone unit in the 65th Brigade of the AFU. A moving train is a challenging target. Uh, but it's worth the extra work as trains carry thousands of tons of cargo. So such stri strikes cause disruptions to Russian military logistics. I mean, I have no idea if, if the train here uh, was stopped, uh, to be on perfectly honest. Um, but I haven't had time to look at the footage too closely. But they are, not for the first time, targeting trains. And I think this could be fairly fairly useful for the Ukrainians as trains are one of the main ways the, Russian, uh, the Russians carry out their logistics. So significant there. Um, and then, yeah, talking about the, the plane that was possibly shot down, it, PS01 here says, apparently a Sioux... 34 tried to launch glided guide bombs. A report that a Russian plane was shot down, waiting for more information. So we don't know about that, but it could there could be a Su-34 that was shot down, it, possibly in the Kursk region there. Um, reports that Russian aviation has shot down what has been shot down again over the battlefield area of Kursk as war monitor there. So that could be the Su-34. Some some here saying it could be a Su-35. The same reports of Su-35. So who knows? But it, it could be good news for the Ukrainians over the Kursk region in terms of aviation being lost by the Russians. Uh, one to three, there were, no, at least two helicopters actually, possibly three helicopters and possibly one fixed wing aircraft. Right. Um, John P's done a massive analysis of another one of satellite imagery and bases and BTRZs, which is sort of these refurbishing plants of these uh, vehicles. I'm joining it at number 37. So you can go and check John P's first 36 tweets in this very long thread. He said, all in all, BMPs in storage, so infantry fighting vehicles are now mostly just used as spare parts donors. This is likely because BTRZs are already overworked and have a huge backlog of equipment they can't refurbish in time because of bottlenecks. So far, Russia has relied mostly on MTLBs to compensate for the lack of armored vehicles, but these are almost extinct from storage it's quite likely that russia will now face even bigger mechanization problems so we're most likely seeing an increasing share of atv so those are quad bikes and motorbikes uh, and motorbike assaults and not least because sometimes these also fit better the russian assault tactics so it could be that they're having to do that but all, like i've said before but it's also possibly advantageous for them to use such vehicles in certain circumstances it's difficult to know you know what exactly is going on this doesn't mean that russia will run out of armored vehicles in general or bmps in particular just their current shortages will become bigger as time goes on but we almost but we shouldn't also forget that russia has managed to increase their bm3 production rate since the war started so they are still producing bmp3s but bmp2 Twos have been lost at the largest rates, and BMP ones appear to be in very short supply. Apart from now, they're starting to move on to sort of the support vehicles. Also, we mustn't forget either that a lot of equipment removed from storage in massive numbers early in the war wasn't only to replace losses, but also to equip new units as the Russian army expanded. Conclusion one is now more crucial to monitorize, I don't know that's a word, um, BTRZs than storage bases when it comes to BMPs. In other words, we need to start looking at the refurbishing plants and how many, uh, how many vehicles they've got in not storage, but, you know, ready to be fixed up. The stockpile, two, the stockpile keeps getting smaller. Three, cannibalization efforts have now mostly left the ones still in storage useless unless they're, they are thoroughly refurbished or even reconstructed. Four, Russia is still a long way from depleting their armor inventory and they'll rely on older types of equipment to partially compensate shortages. So while Russia did demothball about almost 400 BMPs this year, most likely they were sent to BTRZs to be refurbished. In turn, the units in Ukraine most likely got a bigger number straight from BTRZs after being refurbished from their backlog to partially replace their many more BMP losses, plus newly produced BMP3s. Uh, so um, that is to say that they've lost huge amounts of staff. They're going to be uh, relying a lot on older and older vehicles, but they are also still producing BMP3s and have upped their production of BMP3s and the sort of more recent ones. And they are still like cannibalizing and trying to put together in BTRZs these other BMPs as well. There are no BMP twos in storage. Am I correct? That's that's correct. No, there's no BMP3s in long-term storage. They're just producing those. And yeah, it looks like um that they're, they're going to struggle going forward but they are still able to pull on an awful lot of kit from you know different differing variants and differing um uh, entire models but 
Uh, it is, I think, just going to obviously get more and more challenging for the Russians. Uh, okay, going on to distant strikes here. So we have four out of four, I believe, Shahid attack drones getting shot down. Ballistic Iskander type warheads hit Kharkiv again. Five from just over the border in Belgorod. There's no time to to be able to stop them. So I wonder if that's S300s being fired again. And they definitely need to find that S300 unit um, to take it out because that was what was causing Kharkiv an awful lot of pain, uh, death and destruction previously. Then with the Kharkiv offensive starting, the Ukrainians were able to use HIMARS to strike those S-300s, S-400s. Uh, and now they appear to have replaced uh, possibly uh, some of them up there and to continue doing that. Uh, all four attack drones are taken out and two KH-59 guided air missiles. I don't know if any anything was struck last night with missiles successfully outside of Kharkiv. Russia attacked emergency service workers again in Dnipropetrovsk this morning. That's actually Nikopol, which is a town or city on the north of the reservoir, the Zaporizhia reservoir. It often gets hammered by just general shelling. I think you can shell across the reservoir. Uh, so the fire station was hit there, breaking windows, damaging some rescue equipment, including the van. Uh, thankfully, no one's injured. I mean, that's what they do, just take out emergency services. HIMARS have struck Russian equipment uh, positions in depots in Zaporizhia or Blast um, or Caches. Uh, Ukrainians hit the area of con concentration of Russian equipment near Starobodanivka using cluster munitions. And you can go and check that out. So HIMARS are still being used. We hear less and less of them, but it might just be that they get on and do their stuff and we just don't always hear about them like we did earlier on in the war. It's a bit you know, passe maybe, or it could be that actually um, they're just using them less. Maybe the Russians have moved uh, more stuff further back out of HIMARS range, but they obviously do have the 300-kilometer variance now. Okay, moving on to other bits and pieces. So Tim White here has a video or, or shares a video, which is pretty crazy, and it's a guy in the back of a, of a Russian ute or SUV kicking out body bags. Uh, so this is the end of the video. You can't see the body bags. So I can't show it to you. Uh, but what's going on here? So they've got body bags with bodies in, you know, black body bags. Uh, and here Tim White says, so when Russia can't afford to pay compensation, this is what happens. So many soldiers are uh, missing. How do I know they're not Ukrainian bodies? I don't, except they would not load them onto a vehicle. They're just leaving them where they fell. So they've, they've collected these dead bodies or these dead bodies have died in, I don't know, hospitals or whatever. And now they appear to be distributing these dead bodies on the field, on the battlefront or near the front line. One presumes so they are, can log them as missing. They don't have to a log those statistics to their higher ups. So it's like, well, we don't know. We, you know, we, we haven't lost this many troops. So on paper, these people still exist, right? Uh, so it's, it's a kind of, reporting to your hierarchy issue but the second component of this is and then we don't have to pay compensation to their families for their deaths because we have no money and so you know both of these elements lead into possibly this is speculation but possibly behavior like this where they're kicking dead bodies out of, out of a suv to drop them in the middle of nowhere. Um, right, there's also this. So UN spokeswoman has said that Russia tortures 95% of Ukrainian prisoners of war. Uh, took me a while to track this down, says Tim White, but Danielle Bell spoke with NOS a few days ago. Thankfully, the... Da oh, okay. So uh, I can give you some more information on this from Anton Gerashchenko here. This is the worst thing, quote, this is the worst thing I've seen in my 20-year career. Over 95% of Ukrainian prisoners of war are tortured in Russia, UN reports. Prisoners of war are tortured from the very first interrogation. They are beaten with metal rods and sticks, stripped naked and severely electrocuted. This is horrible. This is undoubtedly the worst thing I've seen in 20 years of my career while visiting POWs on behalf of the UN. This happened to more than 95% of Ukrainian POWs. This is tantamount to a war crime. Danielle Bell, head of mission for the United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, said on the air of the NOS Dutch TV channel. Danielle Bell explained that UN representatives have full access to Russian prisoners in Ukraine and can communicate with them. However, they are not allowed to communicate with Ukrainian prisoners in Russia. The, quote, the treatment of prisoners in Ukraine and Russia is completely different. Ukrainian conditions of, different, of detention comply with international humanitarian law, she emphasized. Why is this not on mainstream media outlets in particularly the US if if the US population heard about this and heard about heard about how disgusting the Russians are treating Ukrainian pr prisoners of war then you get a lot more uh, support for what uh, support for Ukraine like this should be 
beamed out. This this kind of interview should be absolutely front and center of reporting on Ukraine at the moment. And it's really frustrating that that is not the case. Uh, Ukraine has officially launched the Army Plus military app. Quote, the goal is to free the army and slow from slow paperwork so that commanders and soldiers do not waste their time on outdated and unnecessary bureaucracy and filling out papers. Um, so that that's good news. Uh, hopefully streamlining the um, getting away from the old Soviet era bureaucracy for the Ukrainian army. Uh, Anton Gerasenko reports, as many are, that Russian telegram channels are particularly saying that YouTube has completely stopped operating in, in Russia. Both the mobile app and the desktop, desktop version are down. Monitoring services confirm the large-scale disruption. In recent weeks, YouTube has been slowing down in Russia and the authorities are, have admitted to uh, completely blocking it. Um, also, is affecting other services too. So I believe there's. I saw an infographic of like thirty or, or I don't know, a whole host of other services that are affected as as a result of this too. So this is Russia going into full on dictatorship shutdown uh, of information, so on and so forth. Uh, and then just this, I don't know what to make of this because I don't know enough detail. But transfer of an S four hundred missile system from or, or launcher. Uh, from Sevastopol to the north. I don't know whether north, like uh, this is according to Crimea and Wind, uh, one of the the information channels coming from Crimea. I, I think this is a partisan channel, and um, that it could be significant. It could be getting taken up to Kursk to show that things are things are difficult in Kursk, and then it also means that Crimea is weaker from an air defence point of view. And the larger picture is they don't have enough to bring. From elsewhere, there's talk talk of them giving an S four hundred system pro- possibly to Iran. Recently, um, I just think you, Russia are in some serious equipment um, issues, and uh, and Ukraine need to keep hammering Crimea, uh, particularly taking out as much air defense as possible and hammering all logistics to make t- Crimea effectively useless for Russia and untenable to keep controlling in any meaningful way so that no logistics goes through there. It becomes essentially um, a bit of a ghost town as far as, uh, uh, or ghost peninsula, as far as uh, the Russian army and the navy are concerned. And then you can take it if you want, but uh, it's probably going to be expensive to take an area like that. The better thing to do is just make it completely useless. Um, and then that that is that is functionally the same as taking it to a degree. Anyway, uh, I really appreciate your support. Thanks for listening. Take care. Speak soon. Tool pips.